Hello, everyone, and welcome to Writers Drinking Coffee. This is a podcast based on writers sitting around, drinking coffee or wine, and talking about writing, publishing, and the whole creative process. We do not censor ourselves, so consider us PG-13. Your hosts today are Chaz and Karen Brenchley and me, Jeannie Warner. This is episode 52. Episode 52 involves interview with Kat Rambo. Welcome, Kat. Hello. Thank you for having me. For Thank you for coming. Episode 52. Go ahead. I- I wanted something really big and exciting because this this represents we've been at this for a solid year now, and it's exciting for all of us. We've had a lot of people on it, but you, dear lady, just won a Nebula a Carpe Glitter. <laughs> Congratulations! I, I'm I'm still stunned by that. It I had talked myself out of thinking that I'd won. Uh, by the time that they actually announced it, had a, a kind of wonderful moment of just like, oh shit, I was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've been nominated. You've been a bridesmaid before, right? Yeah, yeah. I had, I had, and that's why you don't, you don't want to, uh, you don't want to tell yourself that you've won anything, right? I think that's a super bad idea. Yeah, um, I used to be a crime writer back in the day, and Ian Rankin and I used to have this absolute solid agreement that every time we were both nominated for an award, he would win it. Uh-huh. Oh, it wasn't exactly an equitable agreement, but no. yeah, it's I think, worth. I think you need somebody to help you negotiate, Chaz. Yeah. No. yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, since you started this and have been nominated before, so clearly you've got something going right for you. Um, we love to talk to people about where they came from, how they got there. Like, I noticed on your background that you mudded which we've talked about mushing before, but we've never talked about the multi-user dimension. Tell us about Armageddon. What did you learn I, from I, it? I did. And actually, Armageddon was the first role-play enforced mud, uh, as opposed to role-play encouraged mud, which meant basically we had a staff who would come down and, and enforce, sometimes overly enthusiastically. Uh, before I got there, um, what did I learn from mudding? I learned a huge amounts about coding. In fact, I ended up working for Microsoft pretty much on the basis of what I learned from that. And I learned how to manage people, uh, which ended up being very useful because the other reason I went to Microsoft was to manage a team of writers. There is some... For, for those of us who, who do not know these things, what is the difference between mushing and mudding? I don't know what mudding is, to be honest. So a uh, mud... Stand, it stands for multi-user domain or multi-user dungeon. Yeah. And if you ever played the old Zork game, or basically you go north and you encounter a, a paragraph of description saying what you see, yeah. that's what a mud is. Okay. Now, mushes... Go I was going to say the difference between mushes and muds are muds tend to have devices or monsters. As you walk in, you can look at yeah. a thing... And it does a lot of dice rolling for you. Mushing mm-hmm. is a great deal more of the storytelling interactive. Um, right. So Alexander Voynev, for instance, I met because we both mushed. And a few other people oh, nice. we met because we both mushed. So it's, it's a start. And you learn to describe things. But, yeah, oh, it's, yeah. gaming well, is an Armageddon, excellent. Yeah. Armageddon's still going strong. Cool. And then you, we went in there. What was the writing in the? Did you do something to do with evaluating games for a while? Where else? Where else did you do in the gaming world? Um, I did some game journalism, uh, but mostly I stuck with Armageddon. And in fact, most of my game journalism was basically attempts to promote the subtly um, promote the mud. Uh, one of the things that I was doing in the mud was creating a lot of the sort of documents within. Uh, so I was doing folk songs and sat- I had a, a character who was doing a lot of satirical political songs that ended up becoming part of the world. Uh, so I, I, I honestly, Armageddon was the huge focus of all of my game writing. Nowadays I've done more. I actually helped with a D and D source book and, and contributed part of that recently. And was- Oh, I'm doing that right now. Which one did you do? It's uh, Greg Wilson did this Kickstarter thing called tales from the forbidden library. And so he had different people do uh, descriptions of books that are magic items. 
Mm-hmm. So each of us contribute a handful of those. Nice. Was there a, isn't there a Shambhiev Cogman that does uh, the Invisible Library series? Is that similar yes. at all? Yeah, it, yes, that is. It's the Invisible Library. Sweet. Because that's, that's such a neat and interesting way to, they, they created a whole possible world of RP in there. So Yeah, yeah. Well, libraries are just inherently fascinating, right? They are. I could be lost in them. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Chaz, Chaz has been, what was the one that you loved so much in Britain, Chaz? Oh, the Lurton Phil. Yeah, in Newcastle, there is mm. um, this uh, Georgian building with a Victorian interior, because it had a fire in 1850. Um, and it's the home of the Literary and Philosophical Society of Newcastle upon Tyne, oh. um, or the Lurton Phil. Um, and it's it's beautiful. I mean, it's it's been an organisation since the 1790s, I think. Um, and um, Humphrey Davy demonstrated his safety lamp there, which is a big deal. There's a plaque about it on the wall. Um, and um, it's 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 just it is the place, or became the place for me to be a writer in. Um, down down in the basement, they have a silence room. And and that was that was my den, and I had my table, um, and woe betide anybody else who sat at my table, um, or spoke in the silence room, which they did. Is this like um, the Diogenes Club for uh, more um, Mycroft? <laughs> yes, much like. And the thing is, so you walk into this place, and you know, so we have a we have a, a library in Sunnyvale, which is not the Lyttonville. Mm-hmm. And but you walk into the and fill and it's a, a couple of this giant room, two stories high, wall to wall books. And what was the one that you needed? To, um, you needed, and it was like you know. A oh, did it up. Um, I was studying Esperanto for a novel I never wrote, um, and I needed an English Esperanto dictionary. Um, and and you can buy them, you can order them online. But I thought I would just check the and fill and see if they had one. Um, and of course they did, wow. and it was the original, the first English Esperanto dictionary by the guy who invented Esperanto, <laughs> um, and and it was published in 1910, and and I went up onto the balcony to find it, um, and I, the, the balcony was this really scary sort of high narrow thing that encompassed the entire reading room, um, and. Um, and I found it, and and I took it off the shelf, and I looked at it, and I saw since it had been bought in the year of publication, nobody had borrowed it. Ah, um, but kind of it, sad. Was, it was a part of the permanent collection, so it was because permanent in for the in little fill terms. If it's the permanent collection, it's permanent. We keep mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 clearly they had bought it for me 115 years down the line. Oh, I was just so delighted. I can see that. So uh, Chaz and I are also members of CIFWA, the Science Fiction uh-huh. Fantasy Writers America. You are the recent CIFWA Queen Mum. Is that what you call it when you've uh, stepped down as president? You've done it twice. I, I was. I was president for four years, two terms, and I was vice president for a year before that. So I I spent five years on the board. Uh, so yeah, you, you must have been there during the turbulent years. I well, actually, so during the turbulent years, I was the head moderator of the discussion boards. Oh, that must have my, been fun. Oh God! <laughs> so they they, wait, had, wait, they wait. brought me. Don't chase yeah. people off here. <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I, I will say uh, I made changes so that the discussion boards were much less contentious uh, and just sort of the sort of shenanigans that had been going on were no longer allowed. Right. So it, I, I want you to, it. let's take a second. We have referred to CIFWA here and there, and we've book linked it. We've never really broken down and talked about what CIFWA does for the writers and why somebody would want to be in it. Would you, would you mind soapboxing a little bit for CIFWA? I, I, not, at, not at all. The joke is always that, that not only have I drunk the Kool-Aid, but I was involved in brewing it for a while, and I'm always prepared. <laughs> perfect, to perfect. Dish some up. So CIFWA was founded uh, 55 years ago, actually, by a group of the big name writers, including uh, Robert Heinlein and uh, Asimov and Bradbury. 
in reaction to the fact that a lot of the lesser known writers were having a great deal of trouble getting paid. And CIFA basically, they said, we're going to use our clout in order to make sure that writers are getting a better deal in science fiction. And in the intervening time, CIFWA has become a uh, 501c nonprofit organization. It has close to 2,000 members, and it uh, has added so much in recent years that I, I can't even really sort of start. But one of the things I wanted to say is that while membership is restricted to professional science fiction and fantasy writers and, and basically that's somebody who's getting paid a certain amount. It has a lot to offer even people who've never made a sale, uh, who haven't even started their first story. There is a CIFWA blog full of great information for writers. There's a program called Writer Beware, and yeah. Writer Beware will make sure that you don't get scammed. You can always write to them and say, hey, I got this offer. Is it too good to be true? And they will write back and probably say yes. <laughs> yeah. I, I've and, gotten a few of those. Oh, just yeah. give us $5,000. We will publish your oh, book. God. It's going to look so pretty. They're so awful. But in recent years, they've also added one of the cool things for newer writers is a mentorship program. Uh, and right now, while it's not, they, they sort of they open it every six months or so, I believe, uh, you can sign up in order to get notified when it opens again if you go to the CIFWA site. So I, have, I regularly mentor. Go ahead. How does that work? Can you Basic, basically, you write in and you're, you say, here's my experience from the mentee side. You write yeah. in and you say, here's what I want out of this relationship. Uh, here's what I am coming with, and they match you with someone who is volunteered to serve as a mentor. Some of them are CIFWA members. Some are actually writers who aren't, uh, or at least writers but not within the org, are eligible to be mentors. Okay. Uh, I, and then for a period of three months, you meet with your mentee every once in a while, and you give them career advice. Okay. Do, does it cost the mentee at all? Oh, God, no. Excellent. No. So that link will be on the site. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I was going to say there's um, an associate membership as well uh, because we have. Right. So t it, you don't have to be full-fledged. I think it's, what is it, you've, you've got a novel or three at professional rates. Is it eight cents a word or whatever it is now? So talk, talk about the different levels of being able to join it. So you can join as uh, certainly an active membership is, is sort of the top tier where you have sold a book at, I want to say $5,000 advance. I, I would need to go back and look at that to make sure. Um, or you have sold three short stories at eight cents a word or higher, but you can get an associate membership, which gives you, I think, pretty much all the same stuff. Was there, um, I, I, think I was going to ask. For one I, short story. Uh, is there something going on that they're talking about opening up to graphic novels or game books at all? Or is there looking they have, at they are. Yeah. They, they, recently, they recently have taken on uh, independently published writers, small press published writers, uh, game writers, and most recently the membership voted to and allow uh, comic book writers and graphic novelists in. So they are figuring out the rules around that, but it has been approved. Cool. So yeah. So they didn't have their own already? They didn't have an equivalent group for the graphic novelists and writers? I'm sure they have one, but not for people focusing on specifically in fantasy and science fiction. Ah. Ah. Although I thought all graphic novels were fantasy <laughs> and <laughs> by nature. Listen, Missy, I had a full selection of classics illustrated at one time in my life. So. Oh, God, yeah. Yes, and right. Matt edited those. I know, oh, Madeline Matt Robbins. <laughs> Robbins. So I know Madeline. Yeah, of course. it's a tiny world. Everyone Everybody knows Madeline. Madeline. It is a tiny world. Yeah. Awesome. So you, you beyond that, I noticed on your website, which is uh, kittywumpus.net, and I'll put the link up, you have the Rambo Academy for Wayward Writers, and I just mm -hmm. love that name so much. So um, that's kind of subscription-based critiquing. Tell me how they... how. That works for folks. Well, they, there's multiple components to it. It started because uh, um, people were asking me how to take my classes if they were not in the same geographical location. So when Google Hangouts rolled around, I started doing an online workshop 
and then ended up adding more classes as people said, hey, we really want a class that focuses specifically on beginnings and endings, mm -hmm. or we want a class that's on characters. And then at oh. some point they said, hey, we know you've got some friends who teach. Could you maybe bring in Ann Leckie to talk about space opera? And I bet. <laughs> Uh, and yeah. so, uh, like, teachers include Sean and McGuire, uh, Fran Wild, uh, it, it, just a whole bunch of really awesome people. I just got Henry Lean uh, is going to come teach two new classes. But then we have recently added a component, a sort of virtual campus, uh, which is a chat server, and then what we call Crit Club, which is a critiquing swap uh, for people who want to uh, trade story critiques. And then we I also do a lot that. of events. You're yeah. running it on a Discord server, right? I am. And we've been using Zoom. We do like co-working sessions. So like earlier today, between one and three, I logged on. And, and I think there were about 22 of us all together. And we all just worked together in silence and checked in every once in a while, said how we were doing. And that's been amazing. That's what's kept me productive. I was just going to ask, how, how do you find time to write among all these activities you do? I... I'm, big, I'm a big believer in button chair. I'm a big believer of yeah. timed writing sprints. And I'm a big believer in doing word count, but not saying they're going to be fabulous words. Just saying I'm going to do X number of words. So what do you, what, what do you try to do? Like uh, we, we have talked to a lot of people that have been mentioning how, how difficult it is, you know, writing in the time of cholera of actually just sitting down and saying, I'm going to ignore the zeitgeist. I'm going to get the heck off Twitter because I've been too mouthy on Twitter, you know, or any of these other things, like I'm going to focus and do this thing. How do you just schedule it? Or are you just merciless with yourself? I, your I calendar? schedule it. We have scheduled calls uh, and some days it's in the mornings. Uh, some days it's in the afternoons. I just added a couple of evening sessions for people that couldn't make the uh, weekday ones. And I, uh, I, we do writing sprints. Basically, I, we go around and say, everybody says what they're working on. And then I say, okay, I set a timer for half an hour and we work silently. And often oh. we, we sound like we've been pledging to avoid Twitter. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Chaz, let's do that. <laughs> you've, been, you've been better at it than I have in all this time, but I've, I'm trying to get a 5E problem out the door. It's yeah. hard. Oh, yeah. And Facebook, too. Stay away from Facebook. Just Any social media. Oh, but somebody on yeah. the Internet is wrong, and I have to help them. Yes. <laughs> you are helper, Jeannie. <laughs> yeah. I, I love XKCD. I love, I love oh, XKCD. XKCD is oh, yeah. the best. So you, uh, you and Chaz have both – actually, I think, Karen, you have two, all three of you have gotten into Medium. Uh, talking oh, yeah. about, like, I, I, read, I liked your successful and productive co-writing. So if, if Madeline and I were going to write – my her her historic detective heroine and my modern heroine in a time switch crossover i oh yeah liked your discussion on that i yeah i just started uh doing medium and, and honestly part of it is because i'm always looking for ways to sort of promote the school and, and and raise profile and all of that but i really i like that platform a lot for some reason i think that the uh if you're one thing that the editor is very easy to use, but there's something about the look of it that makes it feel very kind of clean and crisp and nice. Uh, so I've tried to been trying to do a, a story or two each week on there and talking about writing or recently kind of like how talking about how to be productive in the face of the overwhelming bad feelings that uh, seem that's, to be coming out of Stanley. And that's so something everyone can relate to of that day when you just, it's hard to get out of bed without bursting into tears. How do you then become creative? And yeah. And I will, I will put in one more plug for medium is there, there are several, you know, every now and again, there'll be a, a something like that popping up saying here, come post here medium. If, if Jeff Bezos chooses medium to talk about being, um, being, uh, ask for money because they've got pictures of him having nude pictures of him from his affair with his, you know, whatever. Oh, and he yeah. goes on there to tell his point. That kind of legitimizes mm -hmm. medium. You mm -hmm. know, there's <laughs> other other people who have chosen medium as their platform as to medium. Oh, as, yeah. yeah, as their <laughs> medium to um, to to do things like that, very public, yeah. very you know, you know, names you would recognize. And so once you get past the 100. This is how you make money on Medium posts from newbies. Then you actually get to the meat of stuff. It's very interesting. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, there's some really interesting and good and, and often deeper looks at stuff on there. Yes. yes. It is. So I was going to say you, you clearly set aside time and space. Are, are you purely straight to electronics or do you have a notebook you keep with you for different moments? Or how do you organize your thoughts and, and not lose ideas that flip through your head or weird dreams? I, I have a big artist sketchbook that I carry around. And it, it does have this sort of like it has an index in the back to sort of let me uh, figure out what's on what page. And I'm pretty good about putting all of my notes on that. I like to do a lot of writing by longhand. I'll take it out on the porch and watch the birds and write. But I also do a certain amount of dictation. I'm very Ooh. fond of dictation. I started doing it when my wrists were hurting. And, uh, what programs do you really use? Really in the flow, it's great. It's so we, 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 we have a, a, a guy that basically is a Scrivener devotee, and so he, we occasionally have to say, what do you use for your, uh, I, want to, I want to stalk around talking to my computer, what do you use for a word capture? I, I use the Macintosh uh, native functionality. Okay. I used to use Dragon Dictate, but the Macintosh has gotten so much better in recent versions that uh, I'm happy with it. All right, and... There's a question that we always ask everybody. So are you a pantser or are you a plotter? <laughs> the answer is yes <laughs> and no. And sometimes uh, it really depends. I, I do think I, I started out being pretty much a total pantser and I've moved much closer to an outliner simply because I find it saves me a lot of really frustrating work uh, at the end. To make sure that you named the same guy Jim all the way through. Oh, and, uh, don't, oh God, yeah, yeah. Oh, thank God it's not just me. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't, he, <laughs> wasn't he Gary in Chapter 1? Oh, oh. God, and, and then it's just like, and why is he in this room, and then he's in this room, and oh, my God, I wrote this scene five times from different angles, and yeah. yeah. Um, how do you define, divide your, um, your writing time between novels, novelettes, novellas, short stories, do you, do you have a sort of system there? I, I don't really have a system um, other than I try to have at least uh, a couple of longer projects that I'm working on, and then I let the shorter stuff sort of appear as it will. Because, yeah. uh, uh -huh. you know, nobody's making much money off short stories. Yeah, uh -huh. sure. It's, do they... I mean, you've, you've won a nebula now. You're going to be a sought-after name for everybody to say, oh, Kat, can you submit a... I mean, you've published in all the big ones. You've been in Asimov's, right? You've been in Clark's. You get published And, and I just sent something off to Analog, so we'll see if I can crack Analog. Ooh, the Triple Crown. Yeah. That would yeah. be the Triple yeah. Crown. <laughs> yeah. Analog, analog is, is the hard one, so yeah. uh, I'm sure you can do it. It's, it's the science-y one, and I'm not really sure that science-y is my forte. Oh, I, uh, you have a lot of humanity in yours, and I don't think humanity needs to be quite as divorced from science-y as no, some may put forward. Also, an, an awful lot of science and science fiction is hand wavy -um. So yeah. just make it sound, sound realistic enough, although for all I know, you've got actual real science in there, so good for you. <laughs> we'll see. If, if Analog is listening right now, they should go read my story <laughs> and, and just reply and say, they, yeah. They are totally sure. every yes. I, I, have, I have a story idea involving Bayes' theorem, mm -hmm. and I think that, um, which, is, which is... Genuine science. It's genuine science, mm -hmm. um, but I have to understand it well enough. <laughs> and I've decided that I'm never going to be able to do Bayes' theorem, but I can understand it well enough to, for a story. Oh, there you go. Is this another computational thaumaturgy idea, or is it? No, no. It's I. I will not tell you now because it's my story and I haven't written it yet. So <laughs> we're not putting it on a podcast. Come on. Oh. <laughs> the statistical analysis of the Superman gene and go. Huh. I could see that. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, actually, that's that's not a bad idea. Right. Uh, John, one of our other uh, hosts, when he has the time and is in the middle of work, he has a bunch of younger kids he's been working with. So um, in there, let's just call them somewhere between 15 and 25. What advice would you have to his, his newbies writing, sitting down, figuring out how to write a story, where to go from? I would say that one of the most important things is just to sit down and write 
and not worry about whether it's good or not or whether it's a story or not. Just start getting words on the page. And one of the things that will happen is you will find that the story starts to flow because we know how stories work instinctively. We've been absorbing stories all our lives. So you can trust that instinct. Just sit down and start writing and see what happens. I think that's awfully good. I mean, it feels like schools make us afraid at that age through high school of saying, you have to produce a 500-word paper. Like, 500 yeah. words? Where are 500 words going to come from? 500 it's good words. And, <laughs> and it's got to be in the form. That's the part that, that's scary. It's scary yeah. is 500 words, and it's got to be in this very strict format. Yeah. And that freezes you up. And like we have a young man that he, he was sure that he knew the story. So I started asking questions like, well, is magic legal? Oh, it's illegal. Uh, does everybody do the same magic? Is there different magic? And about 10 questions in, he suddenly stopped. He looked at me and he's like, I'm writing a novel, aren't I? I'm like, I'm oh. afraid so. <laughs> it was That's like, awesome. yes, it was wonderful. <laughs> You're mean. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> But that's, that's a question of, we had uh, Juliet Wade came and ch chatted a little bit about her world building and saying, even a waste disposal system can be a basis for starting to ask oh, questions. Yeah. So yeah. what kind so of we're questions? Reading, we're reading a book, we're reading one of Mary Roach's books about, um, about Mars and traveling to Mars, and she spends oh, yeah. chapters on the waste disposal system. Yes. So, yes. It, in fact, she just likes talking about waste disposal systems. Just in like, she fits it in in all her books. But they're very informative, and you can learn a lot. Yeah, she does. We, she does the research that you don't necessarily want to have. <laughs> what we what's, were, what's the strangest thing you ever researched, Kat? Well, as, I was going to say we we uh, a few years ago, uh, Chell Lundgren, uh, the astronaut, was the Toastmaster at the Nebulas, and someone had tipped him off that writers really love that sort of detail. And so he told us, it was like 10 minutes of the grossest things about living in space. Awesome. He had that room transfixed. Because we're all just like, oh. Yep. Yep. Such good details. There's people so that I don't her, yeah. think about gravity and peeing, and maybe they should more. I don't know. They should. There's actually, I don't, you may or may not, if you read the Mary Roach thing, actually you need gravity to tell you that you need to pee. Yes. Otherwise, and I just use this in a, as a detail in the book that I had done and my editor wrote and went, is this true? And I was like, aha, here's a link to here in, in space. <laughs> That's fantastic. All right. We, we all love our children equally. But if somebody doesn't know you, and they should, what's your favorite story? Oh, my favorite. Well, so my favorite story right now is Carpe Glitter, which is the one that just won the novelette, which uh, is a horror is, story. Go ahead. But is, no, is, is, it, is it your favorite because it just won the prize? Or is it your favorite because professional creative reasons? Um, it is my favorite because it sort of came out of a bunch of accidents and ended up being pretty good. Okay. Uh, sometimes when you start a story, you know, it's sort of burning in your mind and you're like, okay, yes, I'm going to write this. And this came out of a collision of some anthology prompts and a television thing I had just watched about hoarding and generalized irritation with my family. <laughs> All of that. Cool. Uh, where, where, where was it published? It, it actually was published by Meerkat Press as a standalone book. Okay. And it's under, the editor had come and said they wanted to start this line of standalone novelettes and novellas. And did I have something? And I, I said, sure. I, I've got a link to Meerkat Press forward slash books forward slash carpe yeah. dash glitter. But I'll put that in the link. Super um, nice. In general, we put links to all the stories and the interesting things we mention on our website, which mm -hmm. is www.writersdrinkingcoffee.com. You can also find us on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, we answer email, and we always ask, Kat, if somebody has a question for you, would you mind if we threw it your way to uh, answer in the future for them? Oh, absolutely not at all. Please that feel would... free, and if people are on Twitter, I'm at Kat Rambo on there. You're welcome to tweet at me. Awesome. And I will, I will, before I let you go completely, say you're going to have to email me all of the best links that you like, and I will put them oh, on. I will. Okay. 
You've been listening to Writers Drinking Coffee, a labor of love and enthusiasm put together by the hosts. Our main web support magic is brought to you by Deirdre McGaffey Schween, and our sound engineer and backup spider is David Welsh. Our intro music is Pretty Maid Milking a Cow, and our exit music is Breakfast with a Morning Person, both by Michael Engberg. You can hear more from Michael Engberg on manyhatsmusic.com. Our podcast sponsor is Jackal Designs, enabling you all to buy cool WDC swag, including the Red Coffee is the Best Coffee t-shirt and our Live at Mally's shirt. And hey, thanks for listening and thanks so much for joining us, Kat. Thank you. 